Keisha Johnny's a proud member of Christian Faith Fellowship Church, where we are on a mission to share God's love everywhere we go. We accomplish this by proclaiming the word of God, uplifting the family, and positively affecting the community. I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. God bless. I'm going to preach part two to the message or the teaching I started entitled boldness, boldness. I want to just return to that topic and finish that out today if it's possible. You know, we live, as I said before, in a changing world. It's, it's, it's obvious and it's, and, and it's changes. There are changes that are obvious changes. It's not something that you can deny. It's not something that you can look away at. You can see the changes in every area of our lives. We see it economically. We see it physically. We see it socially. We can even see it in the weather. We are living in a time of change. Now, if you don't want to uh, 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 face it, it's not going to stop because you don't face it. We are living in changing times. And so once we come to that conclusion, then we can find solutions to deal with the things that we can't control. How do we respond to what we can't control? Well, I was just in Texas and um, on that, I, I, and I don't want to be long, but I got to tell you this, I went and played with my cousin. I was preaching for Pastor Bill Hines and I went and played golf with him. Now, Texas in Houston, it was much harder than what we do here when we play golf. It's, it was 90 something starting. And uh, the average person probably wouldn't even be out in that heat. But the Texans have found a way to play golf in the heat. Uh, they keep ice water in the thing. They got these cooling towels you wrap around your neck. They find the shade to get under while they're waiting. You know, they have accomplished or they have learned to respond to the things they can't control. So even if, now when I play golf here in the city, I don't do all of that because it never gets that hot. They may shut the golf courses down if it gets that hot here. But there they have made conditions to deal with what they cannot change. So I'm here to tell you that even though the world is changing, you have to focus in on something that is consistent. Because when you look at the word of God from the beginning of time to this present time, the thing that we understand about God is God's word has been consistently the same. How do you take a consistent God and apply him to a changing world? Of course, we understand from the moment that God said, let there be light to the word being made flesh in the book of John, the first chapter, the first verse saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was, was with God and it was God. And then the 14th verse says, and the word was made flesh and dwell among us. Even to the point where we know that Jesus became the word in flesh. We also understand that God gives warning in the book of Revelation, the 22nd uh, the 19th verse of the 22nd chapter where he says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which were written in this book. So God's intent is for us to consistently see his word never changing. Now, we understand by the word of God that it never changes. It's the same. That's why when Paul after he had established the church at Ephesus and it went to Rome. And in Rome there, he was in prison, not being able to get back to the church at Ephesus. And there were those who had started to change again, those who had heard Paul's teachings, back to Judaism. And so Paul, he selected Timothy, who was like a spiritual son to him, and he wrote to Timothy the letters that he himself could not personally be there to explain to the people. That's why you have First and Second Timothy, which are pastoral epistles. And so when Paul writes First Timothy, he's writing to him to help him give instructions to the church church that he's not able to return to at the time so they could continue the thing that God had called them to be through Jesus Christ. When you get the second Timothy, Nero has burned Rome. He's blaming the Christians for, for the things that he did. It has been said that he burned a lot of Rome so he could rebuild monuments to himself. He blamed the Christians and Paul now is in prison, but he's not just in prison, but he's in the dungeon part of pr prison. And he knows, as a matter of fact, that he may not get out. 
and he knows that he's probably facing Nero's chopping block. And so Paul zeroes in on Timothy in specific to make sure that Timothy knows the things that are necessary to keep the word prevalent and to keep the word forever alive and moving. And so he tells him in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the second verse, there are three verses that I want to bring from this chapter. The first thing I want to bring is from the second verse where he says, preach the word, be instant. He's telling him, preach the word, be ready. So don't, let, don't be off guard, be ready in season and out of season. So at all times, be ready to preach the word. Then he says to him, reprove. That word reprove means by conviction to bring to light or to expose. Let the word bring bring uh, light or let it expose what's not right. Let the word do the exposing. You don't have to do nothing. You don't got to call people out. Just preach the word. It exposes. Use it also to rebuke. That means to show honor. Watch this now. To honor, to raise the price of. Don't let nobody cheapen the word. Don't let them take away from the value of the word. Exhort, make sure that the word is still valuable as you teach it. And then he told him to exhort. That word exhort means to console or to encourage, to strengthen by consolation uh, of comfort. And so he says, do this with long suffering. In other words, be patient with it. Don't become impatient. Be patient and do it for teachings and do it for learning. It's important that you understand that Paul knew that Timothy had to continue what he started, so he made sure he understood how important the word was to be consistently out in front of the people. The second thing he tells him is to study to show thyself approved. A word need not be ashamed. This is a scripture that I chose from the, from the second chapter, the 15th verse. Study to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he was telling him when he said study, that word is spadazo. He was telling him to stay diligent, to put forth an effort, to strive, achieve, and finish what God is starting. Don't let it fall with you. Keep it going. Strive, put forth an effort, put diligence into it. And that's what we have to do. We can't get discouraged. We have to be diligent. We have to keep efforts and put the effort behind living the word and declaring the word. And then he tells him to rightly divide. That word rightly divide is oath male. It literally means to cut straight. Keep the word straight. Don't let it deviate. Keep it straight. Don't put your opinion to it. Keep it straight. Keep the word the way God intended for the word to be taught. You see, as leaders, we approve. We get the approval of of God when we learn to carefully handle his word and not deviate with opinions and things the way we feel about it. And then he tells him the third verse that I want to use is the seventh verse of the fourth chapter where he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, when you read that scripture, Paul is saying something very specific. He says, I fought a good fight. I hung in there. I didn't give up. I was just like a prize fighter. He says to him, he says, I have finished my course. In other words, I went through what I went through. I was uh, shipwrecked. I was beaten. I was robbed. I was betrayed by my own countrymen. I kept my course. I was run out of town. I had to get out of, uh, escape from a city in a basket through the window. I stayed my course. I didn't get off course because they didn't like me. I didn't get off course because they tried to kill me. I didn't get off course because they tried to do me in. I stayed my course. He said, I, I stayed my course. And then he said, I have kept the faith. That word there literally means I attend to carefully and I took care of, I guarded the faith. I didn't let anybody come and change the word. I didn't let any circumstances. I guarded the faith. Why did I guard it? Because the word has to go beyond me. You got to realize this, that the word is not just for you, but it's for generations to come after you. So right now, we are guarders, guardians of our We are under the we are guardians of the word of God. That's why it's important that you don't compromise because of what people say. You don't compromise because of the way people look at you. You don't compromise if it makes you unpopular. I've noticed here lately in some cities, when I go to preaching the gospel, certain things I say now, people will get up and walk out of the service. I wasn't accustomed to that because I've always preached the word. I've never got up and tell you a whole bunch of what I felt about things, but I've noticed now when I get on certain subjects in the word, people will get this 
stuff and they'll leave right out of service. Why? Because people don't want to hear sound doctrine. They want the word to meet their desire instead of changing to the desire of God that's required by the word. Well, I might as well go on and preach this thing. Yes. You see, if you don't get it, you'll miss it. As I started off, let me just remind you that we live in a bold and confused world. Mm. I'm going to say that again. Uh, maybe you're not looking at it, but we live in a bold and confused world. Some groups have come out of the closet, into the streets, into the classrooms, into the government, all into the hospitals, everywhere. We live in a bold world, a bold, confusing world. Now, one thing you got to understand about confusion. Confusion demands attention. Can I say that again? Confusion demands attention. I might as well go on since y'all look at me like you don't understand. We were coming up as children. Uh-huh. And mama would tell us to do something. And we got to arguing and fighting. Oh, we could get her attention quicker as fast doing that. What's going on in there? And we knew from that we won't have to stop that confusion. We're going to have to settle down. Now, some of y'all don't know that control, your children. Some folks don't understand that control. That, that was a time when parents could look at you a certain way. And you, oh, I'm telling I'm tell the truth now. Look at you, you, you stop. Because confusion demands attention. Look at your neighbor and tell them that confusion demands attention. I could go on, but I'm going to keep on preaching. Anything is capable of getting confused if it's not corrected. Huh? Anything, excuse me, is capable of getting confused if it's not corrected. One time I was following, I was following the GPS system. So I was following it. She, she tell me, turn right up in, in hundred feet, make and and when I got to where we was going, that wasn't where I was trying to go. I knew where I wanted to go, and I was trusting the GPS, which normally gets it right. But everything is capable. Lord, I feel like preaching. Everything is capable of getting confused. But don't forget that confusion demands attention. Now, Jesus, and well, God, God in his own authority, when the world got confused, he judged it certain ways. As a matter of fact, Paul brings attention to the book of Romans, how God had to respond to a confused world where he said, and they did not retain God in knowledge. And so God gave them over to a reprobate mind that which does not prove itself such as it ought. That's what that means. It's unfit for un or unapproved or spurious. Now that word spurious is an interesting word in the Greek definition of the word uh, reprobate. Spurious means outwardly similar or corresponding to something without having its genuine qualities, which makes it false. A falsified or erroneously attributed origin which is forged of a, de of, a, of, of, a, of a deceitful nature or quality. God says I have to turn them over to reprobate this because they won't get right. So I will let the wrong judge them. Doing those things which were not convenient or fitting to God. See, we change, but God doesn't. But what I love about God, even though he is merciful, he's not demanding. Of course, God will not compromise on righteousness. But God does not demand you live righteous. Am I right about it? Oh, y'all know I'm right. If he demands you live righteous, you'd be living righteous. But God, God gives you his spirit and he invites you to live in what's right standing with him. And when the confusion comes and when the rejection of what is right with God comes, there is a response to it. All right. Now, I want you to understand something as we go to the early church 
And I said this before, but I want to make this clear. When you go to the early church back in the book of Acts, you will find that the church was being established. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus sends them to the upper room in Jerusalem. Go to the upper room and tarry until you be endued with power on high. In the second chapter, the Holy Ghost comes. And you will find written in the second chapter the word Holy Ghost three times. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read it real quickly. Uh, I, hopefully they can follow me on screen, but I'm moving kind of fast because I got a lot to get through this morning. You will find, first of all, in the fourth verse of the second chapter of the book of Acts, it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues or other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's the first time you hear the word Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, the second chapter. The second time you hear it is in the 33rd verse where it says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, that he hath shed his forth this, that he had shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So he's telling them that's what you're seeing, the results of the Holy Ghost. And then in the 38th verse, you hear the word Holy Ghost again. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the Holy Ghost or the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see now the Holy Ghost in the second chapter. Now what happens in the third chapter, they get ready to go into the temple. And the gate is called Beautiful. And there was a man sitting at the gate of Beautiful, the gates that are called Beautiful. And this man has been lame for over 40 years. And so you will find in the scripture that the man was asking for them to give him some money. Peter says, silver and gold I have not give you after he told him, look on me. He says, such as I have, I will give it to you. In the name, I have Jesus. In the name of Jesus, pick up your bed and walk. He did exactly what Peter had to give him, benefit of Jesus. Pick up your bed and walk. The man started walking. People were confused. They came. The priest and the Pharisees came, and they began to ask about what means that this happened. Peter began to talk about Jesus and what Jesus did, and he began to declare, and people were becoming convinced that this Jesus was something else. So these Pharisees, you will find out, they had a problem with it. You will find out they did the miracle in the third chapter. In the fourth chapter is when they're confronted by the priest and the Pharisees. Let me say it again. They get the Holy Ghost in the second chapter. They respond miraculously in the third chapter. And in the fourth chapter, they're confronted. Ooh. Somebody tell the Lord, thank you. So you will find something happens in the fourth chapter that's necessary for the progression of the church. It's just as important as the Holy Ghost. You will find the balancing, the balancing participant in the power and the building of the church, the Holy Ghost. And you will find in the fourth chapter that they, let's read. So they were telling them, you don't do this. You don't, because what did they notice? The 13th verse of the fourth chapter says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So you find what comes in in the fourth chapter is boldness. Why boldness? Because the church is fixing to be under attack. And when you are under attack, the last thing you want to be is timid, shy, and weak. Y'all looking at me funny in here. So the balancing part of the Holy Ghost was boldness. You will find boldness in the fourth chapter just as many times as you find the Holy Ghost in the second chapter. Let me say that again. You will find the word boldness in the fourth chapter just as much as you find the word Holy Ghost in the third chapter. Because they needed just as much boldness as they did the Holy Ghost. Look at what it says. They saw that these guys had boldness talking about Jesus. And so you will find out that they begin to command them not to speak in the name of Jesus. In the 17th verse says, now they're commanding, the 17th verse says, but this, but that it spread no further. I want this to stop among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak hence to no man in the name, in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. And Peter responded to them and said, listen, do you expect for us to obey you or God? Then they went into prayer. Woo, glory be to God. 
they went into prayer. You will find in the 29th verse what they said in some of their prayer. They said, now, Lord, behold, they're threatening. And grant us to us thy servant with all boldness that we may speak thy word. Give us both. We ask for the Holy Ghost. Now give us boldness because the boldness becomes the counterpart to the Holy Ghost. Y'all don't want to hear no preaching in here today. Let me say it again. Boldness becomes the counterpart to the Holy Ghost. People that have the Holy Ghost have to be able to be bold in their conviction. They have to be bold in what God says. They have to be bold. Now I'm going to help you in a minute because y'all trying to, y'all think bold is the world. I ain't talking about the world bold. Because we got some bold, wrong people. They bold, but they wrong. You will find out that the third time the word boldness is in the scriptures of Acts, the fourth chapter. It's the 31st verse. It says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. As they had prayed for boldness. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Let me say that again. They begin to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, what does that mean, Bishop Hines? That means that word boldness there is parousia in the Greek. And that word means confidently, freely, openly, and plainly. Freedom in your speaking. Don't be bound. Be free in your speaking. The word of God. Unreserved in your speech. Without Concealment, all of it. This is what he said by everything, all of it. Without ambiguity, free and fearless. We, oh, I'm going to come down here. Because the enemy has worked to try and make the church quiet and not free to speak the truth. According to the word of God. I know what the Bible said, but you know, he, well, God got to, no, 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 no. We don't compromise truth because of our circumstance. We don't compromise truth because of where we live. We don't compromise the word of God because we don't have that right. Can I say that again? You don't have that right to take God's word and make it less and compromise. It. It's like me telling my son, go over there and sit down. And you told me to go over there and stand up. I said, sit down. And I mean, sit down. You don't have the right to take God's word and make it something that it's not. You don't have the right to take God's word and mold it for your convenience. You don't have the right to take God's word and use it for your benefit and don't use it for the kingdom. The word of God cannot be changed by those who declare it. We have to accept it, accept it and live it and be an example of it. And people can see the goodness of God, the delivering power of God, the saving power. Of God. Don't sit up here and act like the word didn't deliver you. The word didn't save you. The word didn't clean you up. The word got you out of trouble. The word's getting you through what you're going through right now. Slap somebody high five and tell them, I'm a witness. I'm a witness. Tell somebody, I'm a witness. I'm a witness. Can I get a witness? I'm a witness. Wouldn't be where I am today. So glad they didn't sugarcoat the word. So glad they told me the wages of sin was dead. I'm so glad they told me the gift of God eternal life. I'm so glad they told me to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I'm glad they told me that. Thank God. Thank God I didn't get a condensed gospel. Thank God I got the full dose. Because that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, people of God, the real call that is on our lives today is to carry this word in the face of adversity, in the face of conflict, in the face of dispute, because the word and salvation works together. Am I preaching, y'all, y'all? And I got a couple of preaching engagements to go. If y'all don't want me to preach no more, I'll go on where they invited me and just go on and preach. But if I'm doing all right, then can I continue? See, the word, the word, 
and salvation works together. Look, look at somebody and tell them the word and salvation works together. You can't get salvation without the word. And if you get the word, you're getting salvation. That's why the Bible declares in the book of Romans, the 10th chapter. I've shared it with you several times, but let me share it again. The 13th verse where it says, the whosoever, that means anybody, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't care where they are. I don't care what they're going through. I don't care what they're facing. I don't care how hard it has been. I don't care how confused they've been. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Y'all got that? But the, the question is, how shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they preach? Or how can they hear without a preacher? How, how can he preach except he be sent? So then faith cometh by hearing. That word sent is apostelo in the Greek. That means sent to set at liberty. That's the goal of the one that show up with the word. I'm sent to set at liberty. I'm sent to set you free. I'm sent to set. Hey, hey, I'm sent. That's why I'm sent. I'm not here to bind you. I'm here to free you. The word comes to free you. So faith then coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Let me go on, 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 let me go on to finish this up. By the word of God. So we understand the word ain't working against you, it's working for you. Word shows up with salvation. That's why it's important to understand this. That the five things, and now I'm going to give y'all two closings today. Is it all right? I'll let you know when I get to the conclusion of my first closing. You see, there are five things that the word of God does. One verse tells you everything. All right, one verse. If you get Hebrew, the fourth chapter, and the twelfth verse, it'll tell you the capability of the word. So the word doesn't need you. All the word, need, it doesn't need you to do anything for it. All it needs you to do is show up with it. Because the word of God is quick. That's what Hebrews 4 and 12 says. The word of God is quick. That word quick means living, breathing, and alive. Word of God is alive. It's not dead. We used to sing a song. We don't sing it no more. It wasn't no long song. It was just a few words. God ain't dead. He's still alive. That was the whole song. God ain't dead. Oh, he's still alive. We sang that song for 20, 30 minutes. Let's sing it, y'all. Let me teach it to you. Let me teach it. I'm going to say, God ain't dead. Y'all going to say, he's still alive. Or oh, he's yet alive. Yeah, yet, 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 yet alive. won't say still because still things don't move. Okay. On three. One, two, three. God ain't dead. Oh, God ain't dead. All right, don't forget that song. You may forget some of them songs Sean them did because they had a lot of words to them. God ain't dead. That's easy enough to sing in the middle of the week at the grocery store. You, you don't even need no radio. You don't need Fred Hammond. You don't need Kirk Franklin. God ain't dead. All right, then. You don't need that written down. You don't need us to email it to you. He's living. He's living, y'all. Word is living, breathing. Yeah, the word is living and breathing. Second thing that that one verse says is that the word is powerful. That word powerful means active. It means the word is active. It's still activated. It, it does what it does. Not only is it active, but the third thing this verse says is that it's sharper then in a two-edged sword, that word sharp, it literally means decisive. It, the word of God can hit where you can't get. The word of God can find what you can't find. 
because it's decisive. It comes to hit everything that's not like God. Not only is the word decisive, but the word is piercing. This one verse says that even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the morals, that word piercing means penetrating. You just keep the word out there. Eventually the word will get through those thick skulls. It'll get through those thick masks. The word will get into the, just keep on saying the word over your children. Don't, don't get disgusted with what they come back home from school. We just keep telling them what the word says because the word is piercing. It'll find its spot and it is penetrating. It will penetrate even between the marrow, the joints, and the bones. Not only that, the word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, the word is fit for judgment. Look at somebody and tell them, don't tell me your opinion, but tell me the word. Because the word of God is the final judgment. Mm, Lord. It's time for the church. It's time for the church to understand how boldness works. All right then, can I have two more minutes? In the text that I chose for you today, a very familiar passage of scripture. You all know the scripture. As a matter of fact, I preach from it quite often because it's a very touching passage of scripture. Paul and Silas, they come into the city, and when they get there, there is this damsel that go before them and said, these are holy men of God. Now, the damsel was telling the truth, but by the wrong spirit, became an irritant to Paul, so Paul cast, uh, Paul cast the spirit out of this damn damsel. The Bible says, and when they found out, those who made money by her, that her, her gift was gone, they became upset with Paul and Silas. The 19th verse says, and when, they, and when the master saw this, the, uh, the hope that was gone, they caught, they seized Paul, and as they caught him, this is the 19th verse, and drew or drug them into the marketplace unto the ruler and to the authorities. Now, I, I, want, you, I want you to understand something. Um, I want you to understand something. There, there are three things that happen to them that the enemy wants to happen to the church. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to tell you why, okay? Now, I'm teaching and preaching. Y'all, y'all, is it all right? I'm, 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 going, to, I'm, going to tell, I'm going to tell you why. I know I'm taking a little longer today, uh, but I'm going to tell you why. It says here, they begin to say they, they brought him to the magistrates. Now, you got to understand the marketplace. The marketplace was a place of business, a place of, 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 of public debate, a place where people would come and speak their political issues, where judgments were given, where people would go and buy food. So you're talking about the courthouse, pick and save, the, the park. You're talking about all of that in one spot where everybody would come and get their differences grieved. So this was a very public place. Look at what the Bible says. It says here, they said they're teaching customs that are not conducive to Romans. They're teaching these things that Romans don't observe. So there are three things that they did to them. The 22nd verse says, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate, those who were the sergeants, those who were in control of, the, of, of, control of order, the Bible says they rent their clothes off. They stripped them naked. Hear what I just said. They stripped them naked. The first thing they did was they were embarrassed. I, I, I'm going to say this, and I hope you understand. It would be embarrassing for me if while I was in pick and save in the produce market, somebody come and rip my clothes off of me. I would forget about what I was shopping for. <laughs> I, embarrassed. I, 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 they embarrassed. That. See, the devil wants the church embarrassed because it's hard to be bold and embarrassed. You hear what I just said? It's hard to be bold and embarrassed. That's why the devil speaks so negative in public about the church. So when we get out, we become embarrassed to say something about it. Because it's hard to be bold and embarrassed. Well, I don't know what they're going to say think of me. I, I, don't know, I don't know. And so as long as you're embarrassed about what you believe, you won't be bold in sharing it. That's why people are attacked to try to change what people think. So you'll be embarrassed not to say anything. 
Be embarrassed to say, I, I go to that church. Be embarrassed to say, that's my preach. Embarrassed to say this with God. He wants to embarrass the church because it's hard to be bold and embarrassed. Is that all right? Second thing he does. Let's keep reading. The Bible says, and they commanded to beat them. Second thing that Satan wants the church to be. He wants the church to be injured. It's hard to be bold and injured. That's why you have so many hurt people in the church. Because injuries shut down boldness. That's the come you got to get healed. That's why the enemy fired darts of, of lies to the church because he wants the church to be injured because it's hard to be bold and injured. You get in a fight with somebody you know, and hit them in the nose and they start bleeding. It changed their whole concept. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. They, they, they change. Slap them real hard and let the ears ring. Hold on. You can knock my eardrum out. It's hard to be bold and injured. You hear me? Last but not least, 23rd verse. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. They bind them and put them in prison. That's where the devil, he wants the church to be bound in our communication, bound in our conviction, bound as like you talking louder than you to make you feel like what you're saying isn't true. He wants to bind you because it's hard to be bold, embarrassed, injured, and bound. So what did Paul and them do when they put him in prison and told him, you got to stay in prison? They got in prison told the gentleman or not. They got in prison and they just begin to call, praise God, gave pra and pray, praise God. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me tell you something. You, uh, praise and they said, you know, they said, oh, they praise God and when you praise God, he'll give you a breakout. No, no. <laughs> just praise him till you come out. No. Praising has nothing to do with you coming out. It has everything to do with God coming in. <laughs> oh, I'm enjoying this up in here. Uh, it prays and has nothing to do with you coming out. It has everything to do with God coming in. They praise God until God got into the prison with them, broke the gates, opened the chains, released. They praise God until, I'm telling you, if you want to know where God is, find out where praises is. God don't have to, you don't have to find God. Just praise him. He'll find you. He inhabits the praises of his people. Paul and them wasn't trying to get out of prison. As a matter of fact, when the jailer came, he thought they was gone. He said, we're not here. This is not where we come. We're going to do what we're both. Boldly do. We're going to go into your house. We're going to save your children. We bold. I don't care if you beat us. I don't care if you embarrass us. I don't care if you bind us. I don't care if you injure us. The first chance I get, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. Went and got that man's household saved and went back to prison. Mastrate the next moment and say, tell them they can go now. Paul like, no, 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 no. There's a second step of boldness. Paul said, no, go tell the same magistrate they whipped us openly, beat us in the marketplace, embarrassed us in front of everybody. Now they want us to slip out the back door and say, y'all can go on. No, tell them to come and take and escort us out, just like they carried us in so the world can see that you may have tried to bind me. You may try to embarrass me. You may try to injure me. But when it's all said and done, God is still with me. And look at what he's done for me. Look at how he's brought me out. Look at where he, woo, look at somebody and tell them, God's going to show you off. Tell them, God's going to, all you got to do is just be bold. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is looking for bold people. He's looking for people who know how to call his name. He's looking for people. I'm trying to help y'all in here. Let me stop now. Yeah. Uh -huh. For the Bible says, see, see we, I used to pray for a Baptist church. Baptist people used to pray something like this. Here we come now, God. A head by, uh, uh, humble down and knee bowed. And I, I, I ain't nothing wrong with that. But you got to change that attitude because you can't get to God really like that. 
the Bible says to us in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews before that, it says, let us, now that we had a high preach, which can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we were yet without sin, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our, he know everything that's embarrassing you, he knows everything, you mistake you've made, he knows all about your shortcomings, he know you done messed up, all of us gonna make some mistakes, all of us gonna do something that we're not a proud of. All of us going to say something we shame. We said, but you don't got to worry about that when you go to God. He already know. Jesus done experienced all that. It says, so therefore let us come boldly, boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of help. Got to come boldly. My second closing and I'm through. We were coming up as children. We lived in hillside projects, and uh, there wasn't as many of us as it wound up to be. But at that time, it was me and Janet and maybe Phoebe, and Mama would keep the cereal in the cabinet on top of the refrigerator. Well, at that time, it was the icebox. That's what we called it. Kept it in the cabinet over the icebox. Now, that's before cereal had fancy names. Just come in a big old plastic bag, corn puffs, it's puffs. No, wasn't no, just puffs. And you get a whole lot of them things. So Janet was going to make breakfast for me and herself, but Mama put up up there because she didn't want us food with her. So Janet climbed up on the counter, opened up the cabinet to get the puffs, and fell. But she fell in a very awkward way. She fell between the ice box and the counter, because so she was kind of like that, like this, feet up. Now I saw her in there. I saw her in there. I got scared because I knew we might be in trouble. So, but, so I didn't do nothing. So. Just, I'm not making this up. So, so, so Janet said, help. That's how she said it. That's how, that's how, she, that's how she said it. I, I'm closing, y'all. That's, that's how she said it. She said, help. And, and then nothing happened. Now, here's the situation. She was afraid to get in trouble, but she needed help from the one that could get her out. Even though she might be in trouble. So she said again, help, and then nothing happened. So Janet just said, help, mama, help. And when she cried out like that, when she cried past her circumstance, when she cried past her fear of being whipped, we cried past her embarrassment, she said, help, mama. And mama came down them steps. And mama didn't whoop her. Mama came down them steps and helped her out of the situation that she's in. You see, the Bible wants you to know that when you call God for help, the scripture says so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If you feel like you're being attacked, just say help. If you feel like you're being taken advantage of, just say, Lord, help me. If you feel like you're weak, say help me, Lord God will help you keep your boldness. Somebody shout boldness, come on. Shout boldness. I wish I had a people in here. I, I, I long for the day when bold praise returned to the church. I long for the day when bold testimonies returned to the church. So glad I'm here today because I had a bold mama. When she got to the hospitals and the doctor said I wouldn't live two hours, my mama was bold enough to say, no, 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 no. Watch my God work. God's going to bring him out of that tonight. And right there in the hospital, in front of the doctors and the nurses and all the attendants, she started praising God right in the hospital. I'm talking about bold. Bold enough to say, I don't care what the devil say. God is my deliverer. Bold enough to say, I'm going to praise him anyhow. She praised him right there in the hospital. I wish I had somebody in here that was going through something that was bold enough to praise God until he come where you are. Praise him until he show up. Mama knew that if she praised him. Stand on your feet, I'm finished.